Hi, in this lesson I'm going to be showing you how to sharpen a curved gouge. Now if you're watching this video you may either be just starting to carve or maybe you have discovered some old carving tools that need to be touched up. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you step-by-step -step process of getting your tools razor sharp. Now if you've ever carved um, with dull chisels, you know how frustrating that can be. And I would definitely encourage you to make sure before you start to carve, and so you don't get frustrated and stop carving, I would suggest that you make sure your tools are very sharp before you even start. It'll make the, the whole process of wood carving so much more pleasant. Now, the very first time that I started carving, I had a very dull gouge, but I also had a big mallet. And it certainly helped because it actually got the gouge through the, the wood, but it's not really the, the recommended um, way to carve. <laughs> Probably not the safest either. So uh, definitely um, take the steps that I'm gonna show you, try out um, the process, and um, it, I know that you'll just be so much more pleased with the, the outcome when you can just slide those tools through the wood and then it just sort of whispers as, as the curls of wood come twisting up. I just wanted to show you some of the materials I use for sharpening. Um, here's a series of stones that I use and I'll talk a little bit more about each of those. Uh, these are slip stones. These are shaped stones that go on the inside of the gouge. And this and this are two different types of leather straps and I'll be showing you how to use those also. That, those are the final steps in sharpening. And I've also got a, a sharpie uh, which I will be drawing on the back side of the tool so I can see where it actually hits the stone. Very, very handy technique. And also I've got some water for the lubricating the diamond stones that I'll be using for the demonstration. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about stones. There are a lot of different options out there. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go out and buy brand new stones. Um, if you have water stones, like the Japanese water stones, if you have ceramic stones, Arkansas stones, um, some of the older stones called the washita, I'm not even sure if that's how to pronounce it, but anyway, <laughs> a lot of times you can find that type of stone in antique stores. That's where I've found mine. And then there's the diamond stones. Uh, I actually started out with Arkansas stones, a hard Arkansas. This is my original one. And I really used that for about 20 years until I started using the diamond stones. And now I pretty much exclusively use the diamond stones for all my sharpening. Um, I, uh, the, the Arkansas stones are perfectly fine. They do a good job. I've just discovered that the, uh, the diamond stones actually are a little faster. Um, the process is f faster and um, I don't want to spend the rest of my life sharpening. <laughs> so uh, that's sort of where I've evolved. Now this one here is um, one I picked up from an antique store. This is the Washita stone and it's very, very smooth, a wonderful stone. Um, again, all of these will work. Uh, but what you want to keep in mind that as you're going through the sharpening process, if you have a lot of metal to remove, you would start with maybe a rougher stone to remove the majority of the metal and it's just a quicker process and then move up to um, the smoother and smoother stones. So when you finish the process, the final stones that you'll be using are as fine as you can get because you really want to have that mirror finish. If you end up using that final stone and you're still seeing scratch marks on the back side of the tool, then you know you need to probably uh, invest in a smoother, um, finer grit stone so that you can really have that mirror finish on the back of your tools. Now these two stones are oil stones, and um, now my teacher is Greek, so he insisted on using extra virgin olive oil. So only the best, <laughs> um, but that works fine. Um, 
he has sort of said if you use the regular honing oil that um, it ends up sort of creating pits in the stones. No, I haven't ever tried it, so you know, that's a theory. <laughs> now a little bit about the Arkansas stones. The Arkansas stones, they range in um, hardness. Um, really, they don't have any numbers involved. They the basically soft Arkansas, medium Arkansas, hard Arkansas, and then they go on from there to surgical black, actually translucent and then surgical black. So then as they move um, to harder and harder stones, I think surgical black is considered the hardest, finest um, stone. They don't refer to the stones as a number grit like many of the others do. Uh, so, you know, the difficulty is, uh, you know, the, the question that I get all the time is what is the uh, um, hard Arkansas compared to with in numbers when you're referring to like the water stones? Is it equivalent to a 4,000 grit water stone or an 8,000 grit or, you know, but <laughs> you just have to kind of figure it out as you go. You really just want to get the finest stones that you can get for this process. Now the stones that I've been using are diamond stones. This is 1200 and they refer to it as mesh um, or grit uh, either way but they, they usually refer to it as mesh because that's how they refer to it as diamond stones but anyway 1200 and 8000. And so what I normally do is if I have a lot of metal to remove, or maybe if I've got a little bit of a chipped edge, uh, just a little bit of nicks on the edge of it, then I would probably start with the 1200. Now, if I have something even worse, like an actual chip out of it, where I really have to remove a lot of the edge, then I would probably start with even, you know, maybe a 400 or 600, which is really aggressive. And so you have to be very careful takes a lot of metal away very quickly and if you don't have it in the right position and you're not exactly sure where it should go it'll go bad very quickly so just be careful with that but in general I stick with the 1200 and then move to the 8000 just for demonstration purposes I'm just gonna stick with the 8000 just to show you the movement of the tools um, how to position the tools and just the the process so let's start with the 8000 this is normally the, the stone that I would finish off with. Okay, and the technique would really be, I would, um, if I wanted to sort of move from stone to stone, would be working to the, the 1200 mesh, um, maybe five, 10 minutes until I get a little wire edge along the inside edge. Then I would move up to the 8000 just to really refine it, to polish that um, uh, back bevel surface and just to really sort of make sure that there's no more of those the original sort of scratch marks. Um, so that would be the process and the, again the 8000 usually is really just for refining and doing that final sharpening. It's still very aggressive. Keep that in mind. It can you can do some uh, <laughs> quick reshaping if you're if you're not too careful. Now what I've been asked a lot is what is that ideal angle of that bevel? Now it's interesting because I never was really taught a particular degree angle, um, but what's interesting is most of the tools that I have, they're basically at that angle which is comfortable to carve. <laughs> and where you're not having to lift it up too high in order to get an awkward cut like that, or it's not too uh, sharp of an angle where you're basically your hands are in the way. Um, so it, it just is that ideal point where you're, you can still wrap your um, fingers around the actual metal part and you can make some very comfortable cuts. What is fascinating about that is um, everybody says that oh the perfect degree is around 22 and a half degrees. So you know maybe 23 maybe 22 degrees but they there's that 22 and a half degrees that is sort of the official uh, perfect angle for sharpening a gouge. What's interesting is I actually measured most of my gouges end up being about 22 and a half degrees. And so I didn't know that. <laughs> so yes, 22 and a half degrees. If you want to sit there and you want to, you know, measure that, feel free. Um, you may have to take some of your tools to a grinding wheel and actually bringing that, that bevel a little bit at a different angle. So um, that really ends up being that sort of ideal angle. And um, now keep in mind the angles 
will change depending on what kind of carving you're doing. If you're going to be only doing very soft wood, if you're only going to be carving basswood, uh, if you're, and, and you know that you probably won't have to deal with a lot of um, very, uh, very hard woods, or worry, won't have to worry about damaging the blade, then you would end up angling the tool in accordance with that. If you know you're going to be taking um, and, and using a mallet and you're going to be doing a lot of sculpture work and you're going to be doing um, real dense wood, then the angle of the tool will actually be larger than the 22 and a half. So, um, you know, those are things to consider. It really depends on what you're wanting to carve. Now you want to stand comfortably and sort of loosen up a little bit because you might be here for a while. <laughs> and you want to stand maybe about 12 inches away from the bench. Um, stand with your feet um, about maybe 18 inches apart just to so you can get a good uh, balance and so you can stand comfortably for a while. And now I want to take and just put a little bit of water on the stone. Now the manufacturers of the diamond stones quite often recommend either using water or water with a little bit of detergent. And I have heard that um, the, the cleaning detergent Simple Green um, is used by a lot of woodworkers for that purpose simply because there is a, there's not a lot of chemicals in that um, soap. And I've just heard that people use it a lot. Now I just simply use water. But make sure that if you're just using water or if you're using water with soap, make sure that you wipe it off when you're finished because it's very possible that just having water on this for long periods of time, it will end up rusting it. So that's something you want to just be careful of. Don't have to worry about that with oil stones, but um, definitely with water stones, you need to make sure that they're nice and dry when you're finished. Now before I put this on the stone, I'm going to take a Sharpie and I'm just going to take along the back side and this is going to give me an idea of where or whether I'm hitting this um, stone correctly in the right position. Okay, so wherever it wears away, that is where it's hitting the stone. And I want that to pretty much be from the base all the way to the tip. So if, for instance, it only sort of grinds away right at the tip, then I've got it raised up too high and I need to lower it down a little bit. If it just hits this base, then I need to uh, raise it up. So, um, you know, that's where you determine whether you have it positioned correctly. So just take this and rock it until you can feel a flat. Now there are going to be times when you have tools that maybe need a lot of repair, you're not going to have a flat bevel. So that sort of rocking and trying to feel the flat is not going to happen. So you want to just take and try to use that and then you can kind of estimate. Then wrap your hand around the handle of the tool. And then I'm going to lock my elbow. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move my body left to right along that stone. And um, the reason I'm doing that is I'm really trying to keep as consistent of a movement as possible as I'm moving along. If I'm just going to take my arms like that and rotate like so, uh, it's going to end up being this very sort of flexible movement. There's not going to be a, a lot of locked in movement. And there's a real possibility of in that process of just going like that, it's uh, one side or other is going to be pressing too hard. Something uneven is most likely going to be happening. So that's why I try to just come across and as I move across the stone, the only part that is going to be moving is my wrist or the only part that's going to be twisting. Elbow locked and then just move side to side. Okay, and in that position, there's not enough movement to really let things go lopsided. And that's what we're looking for. Now, I just want to look at the back side of this and see what happened just in those first few strokes. You can see it was actually um, uh, a little bit more on the base here, but you can also see that it was actually worn away in the center right, right along there. So I did hit the center, but it uh, looks like I need to be raising it up just slightly because I want this whole flat side, whole back bevel from there all the way to the tip to be one flat surface. Okay, and as I do this, I'm rotating the tool along the whole length of that blade. Okay, 
All right, look back at it. And all right, it's looking pretty good. And just need to keep on going a little bit. It's certainly hitting that whole back side. There may be a little bit of a hollow ground right there. Sometimes when you buy tools, uh, they do actually manufacture it with a slight hollow ground. So there are, are on occasions when you have the center part here that it never hits the stone. That's not a big deal um, as long as you <laughs> get a sharp tool. Okay, so I continue to rotate it across the stone. And now if I turn it too much, if I twist it too much, more than the actual curve of the gouge, what's going to happen is these corners are going to be rounded over. And if you look at fishtail gouges, um, they, they sort of splay out and get wider at the ends. Um, the nice thing about fishtails is having those nice little sharp corners. Well, if you knock off or soften those corners, the whole benefit of having a fishtail gouge is sort of lost. So um, we really want to make sure that as you're doing this, you're, you're just going along the edge and then coming back and continuing. Now there are times when you may want to take and round over those corners. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that with fishtails, but here are the straighter gouges. Um, sometimes not having those sharp corners are a benefit in certain types of carving, such as when you're carving, let's say for example, beads upside down and you're making these cuts like that, if you've got it straight across, those corners, as it sort of goes over that shape, are going to hit the background first, and then the center is going to hit later. So um, what's going to happen is you're going to have these things dig into the corner. If you sort of round off those corners, everything will sort of hit that background at the same point. So uh, there are times when you may want to customize it that way, but in general, you want it to pretty much, as you're looking at it like this, the blade goes straight across. Now also, if you don't turn it enough, if you don't rotate it enough and, and complete that whole edge, what's going to happen is you're not going to hit the outside corners. Those outside corners will be sticking high then. You'll actually look at it like this and it will scoop down and then raise up at the corners. So you don't want that either. Okay, and then you do this, and I would say um, on average, depending on how much metal you need to remove, on average you would probably be sharpening anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, if you have more metal to remove. But the diamond stones are pretty aggressive. Um, I, it's been a long time since I've spent more than a half an hour on a gouge, <laughs> but uh, sometimes if it just starts doing some strange things, unexpected things, or if it's been placed on the stone uh, incorrectly and then you have to fix it. Um, but um, basically you should be able to get through the sharpening process, you know, within a half an hour. And um, it, so just, you know, take that time, relax, put the music on, and then just swing to the music. <laughs> Okay, now I fast forwarded a little bit and uh, I got to the point where I just keep going in this direction until I get a little wire edge along the entire inside edge of that. And you can test that by just taking your fingernail and just dragging up in, in that direction, not that direction, <laughs> drag away from the blade just to sort of feel and see if you can feel this little click of metal along that edge. Okay, and also if you um, just be very careful, at this point the tool is getting very sharp. Um, if you don't have fingernails, just take your finger very gently and go along the edge. Again, in that direction. <laughs> not, the, not in reverse, but you can sometimes feel it just along that edge, little tiny just sort of um, edge that you can feel. All right, and then what I'm going to do is take my slip stones and we're going to get rid of that wire edge. Now there's a couple different shapes I have here. This is one that's got a curve and a corner on it. I could probably use that one. Um, there's one that I made and just um, shaped it myself, a piece of uh, broken Arkansas stone and I shaped it. So let's just go ahead and use this one. Now normally, these are Arkansas stones, normally I would use oil and with lubricating these, but since I'm using water stones, um, probably should uh, keep it basically the same um, same product. 
So I'm going to take this, let's just see if we can get that lined up there. And I want to go right along the inside edge, just sort of walk it along, make sure it hits the edge. Now if you notice the angle that I have the stone, it's a slight angle, so it's creating a little bit of an inside bevel. But and then if you wanted to, you could actually angle it a little bit more to create more of a bevel on the inside. Now there are a lot of people who, uh, as soon as they buy tools, as soon as they get them, they create a very dramatic inside bevel. And um, there are uses for that. Um, they, it certainly helps in some cases, certain types of carving. Uh, but generally, I just take a, a slight angle and angle it in there as and what this is doing right now is taking that little wire edge and it's flipping it to the back side. Now once it's on the back side, then I put it back on the stone. And just very lightly, I'm not really sharpening at this point, I'm simply just dealing with that little wire edge. All right, then I go back to the inside and go back and forth. Now I can do this back and forth, inside, outside. Probably, oh, it really depends on how large that little wire edge is, that um, maybe 5, 10, 15 times going back and forth until that gets so thin that that wire edge just falls off. And at that point, you know that you've got that as sharp as you can get it, except for one final step. This next step is used uh, as the final step in the sharpening process, but I also use it as I'm carving. Uh, if I feel like the tool is getting a little bit dull, um, just you know, maybe seeing a little bit of scratch marks on the wood from the, the tool sort of cutting through, then I would use this process of the leather strop. And I just want to show you what I've done here. These are several different uh, radiuses of wood that I made. And this is actually a V chisel. So if you look at it from the angle, it's a sharp V. And what you can also do is take different radius dowels and cut them in half and use that process also, just so you have a variety of different size curvatures, just to fit the different curved gouges that you have. Then what I did is I took a piece of leather and glued that on to the surface of all of these. This does not have leather. Uh, if Sometimes with the V-chisel, because it's such a sharp corner, um, the leather is almost too thick, so it doesn't allow it to, to reach in to the corners. But these are the ones that we're really um, concentrating on now with the curved gouges. Just a, di a variety of radiuses. And then what I have is some um, sharpening compound or buffing compound, just uh, rubbed onto the surface. There's so much out there. Um, a lot of times it's just um, this paste that you can um, put on there. But whatever you end up using for any kind of um, stropping wheel or um, uh, polishing wheel, um, anything like that, you can pretty much use for this. It really is just an addition to the leather and it just ends up polishing up that gouge and polishing up that blade to just that mirror edge. Okay, so this part here is for the inside of the gouges. Let me just show you how I use that and just press down and pull back. Do not go in that direction <laughs> because you're basically, you're going to do two things. You're going to dull your chisel and you're also going to gouge up your nice piece of leather. So drag back only. And now you can see from an angle, now, I'm not lifting it too high. If it's lifted too high like that, it's actually going to dull the tool. And I'm just going to drag this back. It's amazing what this does. It definitely will just polish up that tool. And I think um, I probably use this, if I'm using a tool maybe, um, you know, for an hour straight, then I just put it um, onto the, the leather and it just uh, it brings it back. Now, unless you have chips out of the actual blade, um, this isn't going <laughs> to cure that. <laughs> you have to take it back onto the stone then. But just for that refining of that edge. Now, let me show you this other one. This is for doing the back side. And this is just a piece of scrap leather. And um, the um, compound that I have on this, it's silicone carbide powder. And silicone carbide powder is what jewelers use for polishing stones. Um, again, you can use the same 
um, material, same polishing compound that I used on the other. Um, it really doesn't matter, just uh, something that will polish. But the process that I used with this was I took a little bit of oil, and of course this is when I was working with my Greek teacher, um, Konstantinos Papadakis, and he um, had me put a little bit of oil on the back, extra virgin olive oil, <laughs> let it set overnight so it sort of soaks in, and then turn over and then put the powder on here. The oil sort of holds it together. Now this is about 20 years old, so um, or, or more actually, probably more like 20, Three or 24 years old and um, and it still held together and the the compound on it is um, still looking very very solid so in order to use this I just take this and drag it back all right just do like that on that side so you can see dragging it back again you don't want to go forward with it you want to just drag back so just a long sweeping movement now you can also use the reverse side of an old leather belt. That helps. It's always nice to be able to actually have things in your home that you can actually make into uh, tools. So uh, that's another technique. And um, if you do not have uh, these shapes, what you can do is actually roll this. And so you, if you need to go the inside, just be very careful because your fingers are so close to that blade. So just another technique. Of, of how to do that. Now once you're finishing with the stropping, uh, then you want to test your gouge just to make sure that it's really that sort of final um, polished edge. And the best way to do that is just test it in wood. You want to take a cut and go straight across the grain and that will end up giving you an idea. If, if the wood starts to sort of shred or rip, then you know that there might just be a little bit of that little wire edge still left on. So you have to go back and do um, some a little bit more of the back and forth inside, outside with the slipstone and um, move, re try to remove whatever is left. Um, so that could be an issue. Maybe you hadn't gotten to the point where you actually got the wire edge along, along the edge. Um, so maybe you have to bring it to the stone again and, and start that again. So there's a lot of things that could happen, um, but um, if, you, if you take each step along the way, make sure you've actually completed that step and then go on to the next one. Uh, you should, by the end of this process, have a razor sharp gouge. And you will notice the difference. If you've had an opportunity to carve with a very dull gouge and then carve with a sharp one, oh, you will see an amazing difference. And it's just gonna be so much more pleasurable to carve. And it will just sing through the wood.